this is Conspiranormal. Welcome back, everybody, to Conspiranormal. I almost said Strange Realities. I'm getting confused. <laughs> it's all under the umbrella. Because we just uh, we we just did our strange realities thing on Friday night with Marco Azevedo, mm-hmm. so the, I almost said strange realities, which was a great success. Which was a great success. Yeah, um, there is now on our Patreon. Um, if you'd like to become a ten dollar Patreon to view it, uh, there is now a nearly four hour video of Marco Azevedo going over the origins of the UFO archetype. So if you guys want to check that out, that's there. But tonight uh, on Conspiracy Normal, we have Delaney Bowers. And Delaney is a... If I missed something, Delaney, let me know. Okay. But, uh, Delaney is a, a student of folklore, knows a lot about it, and is good friends with our buddies in Somerset, Kentucky, uh, Kyle and Nathan and Darian and... Dan Dutton and everybody out there. Um, so welcome to uh, Conspiracy Normal, Delaney. Mm, thank you so much for having me. That was, you know, that's a great introduction. I'm here I, for it. I would say that you're a scholar of scholar. Folklore. Yes. Sure. Yeah. That. I mean, who's to say? Is there a difference? Why can't I be both? <laughs> both a student and a scholar. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So I heard you on. The Penny Royal podcast, the season two, which Surfiel is on as well, um, talking about folklore in one of the episodes. I can't remember which of the, one of the episodes it was, but I thought, well, this would be an interesting thing to talk about because on our show, uh, we talk a lot about these similar kind of things that go along with folklore like ghosts and hauntings and even things like bigfoot or fairy lore which we're going to get into the gin all these different things that we talk about you could kind of put under well i guess you really could put under the umbrella of folklore and but we've never really done a show that's just kind of specifically about folklore and what it is and the uh, and and those ideas and i was like well this would be excellent to get delaney on to talk about it because i've never had just like an expert on about it so i'm I'm glad to have you on the show Mm, thank you i mean calling me an expert might be a stretch but i do have some notes prepared for you tonight so hopefully (laughs) (laughs) hopefully uh none of your listeners turn it off within the first few minutes you know that's my that's my only goal for tonight I think you'll do fine. Um, I could not consider myself an expert in folklore. So (laughs) you know a little bit more about it than I do. So, but I'm curious, what I always ask people um, is how things began for them. So what was it that sparked your interest in studying the field of folklore? Uh, Were there any kind of like experiences that you might have had when you were younger, a child or or whenever? Uh, what kind of started you down this path? Yeah. Um, so from the get go, I have to let you know that as a folklorist, I'm usually the one doing the interviewing. (laughs) And so I genuinely like had to take the time to sit down and sort of chart out my response to this question. So if I start talking too long, please let me know, just like cut me off or interject. If you've heard this show before, we, we, we have some guests to go on for a while. So. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, so I'm not entirely sure that many people know sort of how deeply embedded folklore is into our everyday lives. And so I know that we'll be touching on the differences between folklore and folk life a little bit later on. Um, but I really just can't stress enough the idea that we as living and breathing human beings are enacting folkloric traditions either consciously or unconsciously on a daily basis. And so I think that's just something really helpful to keep in mind as we share our own personal experiences with each other. So when I think back 
to my earliest interactions with folklore, I am reminded of like what a little library freak I was. Like I was constantly checking out ghost related books from our local branch and like the two most popular titles that I love to keep checking out over and over again were Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Oh, I love um, those. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. So, um, sort of like contemporary legends or urban legends that go along with those. Um, and then there is one sort of in a similar vein called In a Dark, Dark Room. And so when I was tired of those, I sort of moved on to materials about witches and angels or aliens and Bigfoot. And so I was enchanted by the Brothers Grimm and sort of the darker versions of their classic folk tales and really anything that was slightly supernatural just like spoke to me on a spiritual level. Like it made sense to me. It just felt right. And so truthfully, like these types of um, introductory publications, I find are just really easy points of entry into the world of the weird. Like, I don't know if you guys had a similar experience, uh, like finding these books at, at libraries and just sort of like devouring them. But that was yes. definitely <laughs> yeah. the ones that you mentioned, the scary stories of Terrell in the dark. I probably checked those things out like several times. Right. So, and I wish I had bought them because I would still have them now because they're just so great. And the artwork alone in them was just, you know, it's, just, it's enough to, to freak you out. Oh, yeah. Like, there's still some of those images that are just, like, burned into my little brain. <laughs> there was another one that I remember. I think it was the Man, Myth, and Magic series. Oh, that's mm -hmm. a good one. Yeah, and I remember those kind of, like, freaking me out when I was a little kid. The cover of the just, first one? I think yeah. That's, um, is that Spare? Which one? The uh, the first volume of that. I don't know. I'm it's got sure. the, uh, the the demon on it. I don't know who exactly it is, but I think it's Austin Osmond Spare. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think so, yeah. But these were like just encyclopedias, and they were really they were really just kind of freaky, but now I'd probably literally like eat them up. <laughs> yeah, and so like I also remember finding immense comfort in sort of religious rituals as well. Like I grew up in a Baptist church, and so practices that related to communion or prayer, hymns or vacation Bible school were like instilled at a very young age. And so I also loved celebrating holidays too. And like the kitchen at my grandparents' house was always this like very heady, very feminine space where I was just like fascinated by watching and learning how to cook certain dishes that were staples at like Easter or Christmas or the 4th of July. And, you know, sort of relatedly, we had um, family reunions every year where like photographs and letters and films and long walks to our family homestead, like all of those things were shared together. And so it was only really when I was an adult in grad school that I learned that all of these things were expressions of folk life. So I went to undergrad at Appalachian State in North Carolina. And when I was there, um, naturally sort of, I took an Appalachian studies course. So that was my first major introduction to things like old time and bluegrass music and shape note singing and contra dancing or Southern foodways. Um, the Foxfire collection mm -hmm. uh, was like super impactful to me. And so all of these things, um, that were labeled as like quintessentially Appalachian, but that course in its entirety was just like whitewashed as shit. Like <laughs> there was, mm -hmm. it was like a very Anglo-centric um, class and it never really addressed the fact that Appalachia is like not a monolith and right. it's like naturally made up of like diverse ethnic and like racial cultures, right? So like, all of these expressions that just weren't being talked about um, are sort of occurring at the same time as all of these things that are like quilts or preserving jam, you know, like all of those things. Um, and after that, I went to grad school at Indiana University. And so there I got my master's in library science. And the biggest takeaway from those few years is that I think I just left with a better understanding of like how information is structured and preserved and disseminated. Like how are um, institutions making information accessible to everyone? Like 
How are we addressing issues of gatekeeping? Or how is the information that is being created and documented reflect the community in which it's shared? So around the same time, I came across uh, the website of a woman whose name is Jennifer Jameson. And she was just doing like insanely cool folk studies work. And I think looking back at it, it was like definitely a school portfolio website, but she was also sharing her fieldwork notes and oral history interviews and photographic essays and magazine work. And I was just like blown away by how impressive all of this was and that she was able to engage with folklore in a way that felt fresh and new and exciting, like at least to me. And yeah, after that, I was working as a reference librarian in South Carolina. And so I just thought I would take some steps to pursue a career in folklore. And I applied to the folk studies program at Western Kentucky University in Bowling Green, which is also where Jen Jameson attended. <clears throat> and so I got a nice little full ride and I worked in the folk life archives. And I just had like the craziest time getting to interview folks and conduct research surveys. I um, did a, a fellowship with the Library of Congress and collaborated with like heritage festivals and just like, you know, worked alongside artists and tradition bearers. And so now I work with the Kentucky Folklife Program as the editor in chief for their digital magazine, which is also appropriately titled Kentucky Folklife. So it just feels like everything sort of fit together, you know, like, all of these things that I was pursuing, even from a young age, have just like come to fruition working as um, a full-time folklorist. Wow, I mean, that's, 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 quite, that's quite the journey. Yeah. I, I always feel like a little elitist when I talk about it, um, but I just also get like really excited to talk about folklore and folk life yeah. and just like, yeah. I don't know, it's... It sounds like what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, it, it really does. It really does feel like that. That's a really good way of um, framing it. Well, you know, I'm, I'm curious about the times that you go out and talk to people. Um, mm -hmm. When you conduct interviews, like, is it more of a that you have a list of questions? Or is it more that you just kind of sit down with this person, maybe ask them a few questions, and then they just talk and you record it? Like, what what's like your technique? And and what are you kind of looking for in some of these interviews? Because in a way, that's kind of what we do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll give you, I guess, one example that I'm most proud of is that I got um, something called the Archie Green Fellowship from the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. And so I was given some money by the federal government uh -oh. to... Uh -oh. um, <laughs> to um, travel throughout Central Appalachia interviewing indie pro wrestlers. Awesome. And so, wow. yeah. Um, and then that kicked off in 2019. I put it off until 2020. <laughs> um, and that's when COVID hit naturally. <laughs> and so I had to, con I was really like looking forward to um, traveling around a few different states and, and getting to interview these folks in person. But a lot of it just wound up being um, through Zoom or Skype or like a podcasting platform. But, you know, I, Oral history interviews aren't necessarily um, like an overview of a person's entire life history, right? They're, they're about a specific event or connection that they have. And so in this case, it was indie pro wrestling, right? These smaller local promotions throughout central Appalachia um, that had their own sort of fans and their own refs and their own performers and their own wrestlers. And I had a, a list of questions prepared, you know, um, maybe like 20 or 25. And then you just sit down and you start with the first one and then you see where it takes you. And I think people really do love talking about themselves. <laughs> like I just did for 20 minutes about my journey. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just a way for them to sort of brag on themselves for a little bit and really just get to share insiders view that um, might normally, you know, go unnoticed or, or not talked about. Is the pro wrestling thing, was that more of kind of like a, 
an anthropological type of study in a way or yeah um it's a like a an ethnographic study of um yeah of just wrestlers who have um been in the business for decades and then um some young guys who are still sort of green around the gills and just seeing how their experiences are similar and how they differ um, based on place or training or even you know sort of like family life or work life all of those things have a direct impact on how they perform that world is something that is semi-secretive mm -hmm. that have, has things that are passed down probably like orally or informally um it does seem like you would relate to a lot of cultures and um there's a lot of interesting stuff in there we find a lot of crossover actually of pro wrestling fans and some of these paranormal interests and in ufos yeah. and bigfoot <laughs> stuff like that stuff like that that doesn't surprise me in the least bit i've known a few amateur pro wrestlers and um they do have that kind of almost a secret society vibe to them Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think it's really sort of the curtain is being pulled back just a little bit, right? Um, and sort of offering a few glimpses into the locker room. Um, but yeah, just being a part of that. And I don't know, I was, I just found myself really fortunate to be able to speak with um, a whole host of people who have, you know, like dedicated so much time and energy into perfecting their craft. I noticed you also did something on taxidermists too. Oh yeah. Um, that was Jim's new life taxidermy. So he was um, a preacher by day and then a taxidermist by night. And so he was over in Western Kentucky and um, that was actually for one of my um, projects in a folk art class that I was taking. Sorry if you can hear the sirens. <laughs> oh, no, it adds to the atmosphere. Okay. <laughs> yeah, apologies for that. Um, but yeah, that was, you know, that was just another sort of oral history project that I got to do as well. And then um, I got to present it at a, at a conference, which was really nice. And also just seeing how, like, those animals were being processed right in front of me. Like, they were, ugh, it was horrible. And mortifying but also like extremely fascinating to just see i don't know deer heads just hanging from hooks <laughs> really gnarly but also really cool yeah i can i can imagine that's a it's got to be a fairly <laughs> interesting place to go to yeah for uh, sure let's dig into the some concepts about folklore yeah one of the things that i was thinking of when i was coming up with some questions for you was um mm -hmm. in a community the role or the purpose that folklore serves and does folklore kind of bring like a cohesion or a sense of community yeah so um by its very nature folklore is communal right so it's in direct opposition to elite culture that demands um more of a top-down approach to establishing value so instead folklore is community-based and it's community-driven and it's a result of these like shared identities. So uh, like we were talking about before, just a little bit, like it's very much an avenue for the overlooked and the underrepresented. And so there's like this emphasis on highlighting the diversity of its creators. And that is critical to the continuation of culture. So uh, there's no like grand theory in the world of folk studies, typically folklorists refrain from chasing after a grand narrative that links everything together because that would require like a level of um, essentialization. So instead, folklorists look at the micro and they look for patterns and examine how those patterns reflect or represent community ideals. And obviously, like communities are so varied too. Like, um, occupations, sports club, um, religious affiliations or hobby groups, family, friends, like all of these are folk groups and we all play um, very specific roles within those groups. Um, and we think of them as like insiders and outsiders. So informal knowledge is being shared within these groups and it's all founded on these like grassroots traditions. So hopefully like that 
sort of ties in together with the idea of um, creating cohesion within a community. Right, it's a reference point to an earlier time in a sense. Yeah, for sure. And still the idea too that like folklore isn't necessarily like the vestiges of something old, right? right. It's contemporary folklore um, and like contemporary folk life practices as well. Like these things are still being mm -hmm. passed down and preserved and they're changing all the time. So in these traditions um, change to meet and serve the needs of their creators. Yeah, it's like an ever-changing tradition in a sense, like a... Right. Living traditions. Yeah, living traditions, for sure. Um, and there, Barry Tolkien is um, a, a pretty well-known folklorist, and he has something called the um, twin dynamics of folklore, right? That it's both static and dynamic, or it's conservative and dynamic. So that like, there are these practices that we know and they sort of stay the same, but we as people who, again, enact those traditions can change them. So it exists within this realm of like homeostasis and constant flux. Right. Makes sense. Just like any other field of study, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about the history of folklore. I don't want to get too involved, but more about how the different ideas have evolved over time. Um, and it's because, like, the study itself has changed in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah, for sure. It might be helpful, again, to contextualize how folklorists attempt to define the term folklore because um, not surprisingly, there's like no one standard definition that everyone in the field agrees upon. Um, so I'm going to give you three similar, but very succinct working definitions. And these ones also happen to be the most popular. So the first one comes from um, Dan Benamos, and he is a lifelong folklorist based at the University of Pennsylvania. And so he uh, offers that folklore is artistic communication in small groups. Five words, there you go, right? Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Um, the second one, again, um, very similar to Benamos, is from um, Lynn McNeil, and she's an instructor at Utah State University. And she posits that folklore is informal traditional culture. So that's three words, right? Even shorter than the first. And finally, the third one comes from uh, Folkwise. And so this is um, an online group of early career folklorists. And they suggest that folklore, again, is like creative everyday communication. So like realistically, all of these definitions are perfectly acceptable and they are easy to remember, but it also doesn't preclude us from having larger discussions about how folk life is um, enacted, how it changes, and who, if anyone, gets to claim ownership. So, I don't know, does, is that sort of helpful? I mean, I have, um, so instead of maybe relying on a, a one-size-fits-all definition, uh, folklore scholars really sort of um, look to these five characteristics to determine whether or not something can be classified as folklore. And so this comes from an American folklorist named Jan Brunbond, and this was in like the late 1960s. And so here are those five characteristics, which I think will come into play um, when we talk about urban legends or conspiracy theories or even fairy lore. Right. So yeah. hmm. we can think of folklore as anonymous in its origins. Hmm. It's either oral, customary, or material. It is traditional in transmission, so like people sharing one-on-one -on -one with each other. It's formularized over time, and it exists in multiple versions. And so folklorists love to say that folklore is old wine in new bottles, or it's new wine in old bottles, but it's never new wine in new bottles. Okay. Does that clear anything up for you? <laughs> I mean, folklorists love that. I'm just putting it out there. Because it, I think it just, 
again, there's an emphasis on something is traditional, right? So the old wine or the old bottles, but never new wine and new bottles. Uh, the practice of folklore has existed, it currently exists and will continue to exist with or without the academic field of folk studies, right? And so what the academic field does is provides um, tangible tools, I think, to help contextualize these beliefs and cultural practices and um, really provides, again, tools to, you know, how we choose to navigate our lived experiences, to think of it as um, another type of lens through which to view our world. Are there ways that the study has really changed over time? Is there a difference between how we kind of view it now and the contemporary in 2022 as it would have been viewed in, say, like 1940? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, let me... Okay, so if we're thinking back to, like, specifically... I would even I won't even like touch on European <laughs> folklore and like how it got started, but I do think if we um, can maybe like travel through a wormhole back to the United States and Massachusetts in 1888, <laughs> like this is really um, like a defining moment in the field of um, American folk studies when um, a folklorist by the name of William Wells Newell. Um, along with like a host of his contemporaries in the realms of antiquity and mythology and linguistics, founded the American Folklore Society. And so the AFS, it wasn't formed in a cultural vacuum, right? So nearly like half a century before the AFS was even established, there was a folklorist named Henry Schoolcraft who was involved in the study of Native American oral literature. And in the years um, after the Civil War, there were like several collectors who gathered together folk songs of Black Americans. And um, the Bureau of American Ethnology at the Smithsonian was formed in uh, 1879. So the American Folklore Society wasn't created like ex nihilo, right? It was work was being done and the American Folklore Society helped to establish a more formalized approach to collection, preservation, and presentation of folklore. So, fun fact, James Francis Child was the first president of the AFS. And so I know there's a lot of conversation um, around child ballads right now surfacing. I think that's what Nathan was telling me <laughs> um, and how they relate to uh, UFOs. I don't know if you guys have come across that yet. Uh... Mm -hmm. No. No. I mean, I'm no. familiar with the child ballads. <laughs> yeah. I'm very familiar with them now, especially after having been around Dan Dutton and, uh, you know, I heard Recluse's interview with him, but I was not aware of some UFO but connection. But you know what? It doesn't really surprise me necessarily. Right. Oh, yeah. Not, not in the slightest. Um, but yeah, so after um, the AFS was founded, its, its members helped to publish the first issue of the Journal of American Folklore. And so this was um, a journal that was designed for the collection of the fast vanishing remains of folklore in America, right? There's all this sort of um, hubbub around modernization and urbanization and sort of factories and industrialization that like, oh no, the rural classes, um, all of their traditions and beliefs and superstitions are um, going to be like lost to time forever. And so there was really this emphasis that was placed on um, collecting and examining English folklore, like ballads, um, folk tales, but it also really allowed for um, the collection of lore relating to groups that were indigenous to North America, Mexico, French Canada, and then um, Blacks in the South. So at its like earliest stages, there was tension between two particular groups in the field of folklore. There were literary driven folklorists and then the anthropology driven folklorists. And um, literary folklorists were concerned with studying like text-based folklore. Again, you have your 
folk tales in your traditional songs that had already been documented, transcribed, and housed in um, archival institutions. And so there was, again, an emphasis on rural European peasantry, like very little fieldwork was actually being done by literary folklorists. On the other hand, anthropology-based folklorists conducted hands-on ethnographic fieldwork. So they were driven by methodology and they centered their work on um, analyzing various like social and cultural groups. So at this time, these folklorists were engaging directly with um, like, again, indigenous peoples, Cajuns, Creoles, Hispanics, like in addition to European immigrants. So I think this is um, really getting to the heart of like your question is that by the 1930s, there was a really big shift away from studying archival collections towards conducting actual field work. So now folklorists are conducting interviews, they're taking photographs, they're recording musical performances, and folklore is no longer sort of viewed as like a fragment, but rather these traditions that are being enacted within a contemporary framework. So your, again, like the examples that automatically come to mind are um, like the Federal Writers Project, right, which was part of the WPA and um, folks like Zora Neale Hurston or Stetson Kennedy or Stats Turkle. And these folks were producing like volumes of ethnographic and folkloric work. Yeah, and a, and a lot of them serve very well for like historians to look back on too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so we tend to think of these as like, these folks as really um, laying the foundation for what would be later called um, public folklore. So today there's like academic folklore and then public folklore. And um, one of like the most notable changes to the field of folk studies happened in the 1970s with something that's called the performance turn. And so this was actually a new approach where folklore was seen as like a process and not simply as a static artifact. Um, and again, this ties back into what we were talking about earlier was like the twin laws of folklore process. So folklore is conservative and dynamic, like certain aspects of the traditions remain the same while some aspects change. And the performance itself really sort of forces us to look at the creators themselves, right? So it contextualizes the performance, it sets up the rules of engagement, and we look at um, tone, gestures, personal styling, space, environment. Like it's no longer just the text, but the person delivering the text. And so that's like the biggest thing that I think of like, when you think back to 1888, um, those folklorists, again, were just collecting things that were being told to them, and the, the people telling the stories weren't really given any credit. And so now um, we really sort of um, really take into consideration the people who are actually doing the work, who are insiders and have that knowledge. In the overall context, like you said, like the where the stuff is taking place. Yeah, so all of that's included in you know, um, again, points to larger patterns that we can examine. The initial drive to make sure the stuff was archived or cataloged because of fears that all these traditions were going to be wiped away, is that, was that mostly due to ideas of what urbanization and industrialization were doing? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, like, if you even look at the term folklore, um, folk was specifically um, in relation to like rural illiterate peasants mm -hmm. and lore was only about like the verbal and um, oral traditions that were being shared. So yeah, uh, you know, it's always this idea of like, um, uh, we are, as a society, like moving from savage to barbaric to civilized, right? And so like 
that idea of cultural evolution, um, folklore was was being studied by urban intellectuals and it, it was used as a way to like track progress, right? So like right. the folks who are in the academy can like collect these old wives tales um, and say like, oh, look, we don't, we don't believe these things anymore. We're enlightened now. And so that was right. a marker of success. And it seems like folklore is really not necessarily in opposition, but um, it, it's contrasted against the academy or, or academic uh, thought and academic study. It's, it's like more of a, these are like the popular folk ways. Yeah. And it's, you know, that's why they're sort of um, making that distinction between um, sort of folklore and academia and then um, public folklore where you're like working directly with maybe local arts organizations um, at like the um, state or federal level, right? Like you're not tied to um, like a higher learning institution, but also like, again, much like folklore, <laughs> like you can sort of flip between these categories, right? Like just because um, I'm a public folklorist doesn't mean I don't engage with academic folklorists and vice versa. Um, so yeah, I don't, it's always very, it's a tangled web, right? It's, it's not um, cut and dry. And I think that's one of the things that's actually really exciting about folk studies. It's always really complex and complicated and, you know, just a reflection of the people who create it. Now hear the sounds of the surf inspired ultimate Tiki Beats. Available on all streaming platforms and digital stores. Limited edition cassette and merchandise available on Bandcamp at newbanghiphop.bandcamp.com. Ultimate Tiki Beats Breaks. Let's get into uh, some specific just forms of folklore. And I want to start off uh, with with fairy lore first. And this is something that comes up a lot on this show, okay. uh, especially with uh, Joshua Cutchin, one of our favorite guests. Uh, he talks a lot about fairy lore. And um, I'm curious about some of this, just like where fairy lore really kind of comes from and uh, how it's been written about and the idea that maybe some of this may be something that's based in some form of reality. I'm getting to the woo-woo stuff here on you. So. Hey, no, I, I love the woo. I'm, I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was actually talking with my mom about being on this podcast and one, I had to explain what a podcast was. I don't know if you still have to do that with your, your folks or your family members. Uh, <laughs> She's like, so it's, a, it's a radio show, right? And I'm like, yeah, let's just call it a radio show. <laughs> they kind of get it after I've been doing it for 10 years. So I think they kind of understand, but they, <laughs> they still ask me, how do I find it? So, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I was telling her that um, one of the topics we were going to be speaking about um, was fairy lore. And she reminded me of something um, when I was younger that she did. And I would say it was maybe from like ages five to eight or nine was that um, she called them moon fairies. Mm -hmm. And so on nights during the summer, like during summer break when there would be a full moon, we would pop a bag of popcorn, put it in a bowl, and walk around the block leaving a trail of popcorn for fairies <laughs> and I like had a flashlight that I would try to find these fairies in bushes and in trees it's just really excited about finding fairies and I would write them a note 
and leave that in my flower box in front of my bedroom window. Mm. And in the morning, the popcorn would be gone. And I would have a very, very tiny note that was written back to me, along with um, a tiny little present from the fairies. <laughs> my mom was really putting in the work. I'll tell you what. Like it was <laughs> um, so I just really love that idea of having a connection to like the realm of fairies from a very early age. And um, yeah, I don't know. Did you guys have any, not that your moms also did moon fairies with you, but um, do you have like early recollections of when you were introduced to fairies or like anything I along mean, those lines? I, I think just for me, it's really just the popular culture kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, just mm -hmm. like, you know, obviously Tinkerbell, the Peter Pan stuff, all that. I mean, um, uh, one of the first things that I remember kind of reading about, which is something that was later deemed a hoax, was the Cotton Glee fairies. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're are you if you're familiar with that, um, are those the black and white photos? Yeah, yeah, where they did these little cutouts, but but the girls the girls did claim that they actually encountered real fairies. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. right. Later on, they hoaxed these. Um, these photos, which actually that's a real phenomenon is people hoaxing things that they lit, that they claimed really happened to them mm -hmm. as some kind of proof, but that's a whole other subject. <laughs> but, but really, I think once I got into the UFO abduction stuff, mm -hmm. that's when I really started getting interested in it because the similarities between the, the UFO abduction phenomenon and the fairy lore and fairy lore is very very strong and then and then i and then josh's books kind of helps me along on that as well but the idea that you know fairies are not exactly the nice little tinkerbell they there's there it's much more they're much more complex creatures <laughs> yeah so um i guess just sort of jumping right into it uh, uh so at a, um, sorry, let me like scroll down just a little bit. Etymologically, um, the word fairy comes from the old French word, which is fata. And so that's um, associated with fate, right? In the, in the three fates. And so it's a word that has um, many meanings and associations, but um, there, it can sort of be broken down into four primary um meaning. So in Old French, which ultimately passed into English, um, this term fata related to like enchantment, fairyland, or like a land of illusion. It could mean a human with special powers, or it just referred to supernatural beings. And so the, the term fairy itself is a relatively modern name. And to a lot of folklorists, like these terms are just sort of interchangeable. But um, fairies, and I think sort of alongside witches and ghosts, are really just like manifestations of the supernatural that ultimately sort of became entwined with folk culture and traditions. And so looking back, beliefs regarding fairies were really sort of closely linked with rites of passage and seasonal festivals. And so these beliefs also played um, a very integral role in how um, like everyday households functioned. So the realm of the Fae is really the inverted image of the human world. And it sort of calls into question moral and taboo laws that we um, might have. So it's a realm that's both a dream and a nightmare. It's like enchanting as well as terrifying which helps to give credence to like hardships that were found in the mortal realm, like mm. deaths or loss of land or illness, which, you know, I think um, makes perfect sense, right? Like if we think of like Tinkerbell and then we think of elementals, <laughs> mm -hmm. there's like such a broad spectrum of how the Fae can be portrayed. And so in 16th and 17th century European folkloric literature, 
the Fae were understood to be potentially threatening or like these demonic entities. And their reputation was closely linked with the devil and consorting with fairies was used as like spectral evidence during the witch trials in England. So stealing children or harming cattle or sort of terrifying these late night travelers, these were popular themes in fae related poems and balladry. Um, and I was like trying to look up a few different um, poems and there is one from a, a Scottish poet um, and it was just, you know, it sort of described the fae as these like really gentle creatures, like red hats, green pants, owl feathers. And then it was just like several stanzas of all the horrible things that they were doing to people um, in this rural village. And so I just thought that was um, really representative of how the fae were viewed um, early on. So there's that part. Any questions? <laughs> The owl feathers thing is interesting. Yeah, it really is to think um, of screen memories and, and that mm -hmm. association too. So yeah. maybe that's something to look in a little bit further why that um, terminology was used. Let me write that down. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're familiar with Mike Cleland, but he's written a whole book about owl imagery in the UFO, the, the alien abduction phenomenon. So he may be interested in that as well. Yeah, uh, that was... Oh, I wish I was going to like read part of it, but I was like, don't be that person, Delaney. So I didn't put it, <laughs> didn't put it in my notes. Um, but, you know, all of these poems and ballads and folktales, like all of these folklore materials were being collected by prominent practitioners um, in the field at the time. And so, like we've discussed before, like a majority of this information was just shared by folks who were living in rural areas and not necessarily in highly urbanized like metropolitan cities. And so there was something that I found really interesting when doing um, some research is that the Folklore Society uh, was founded in London in 1878. And in 1890, they published a manuscript that was entitled The Handbook of Folklore. And so there was a man named George Gom, who was a contributor who was responsible for drafting the section on goblindom. Have you guys heard that term before? No, that's an excellent word, though. <laughs> it really, it truly is. <laughs> um, and so I've heard the term goblin universe. Goblin universe. Yeah. I'm going to go with goblindom. It's like a, it's like marbles in your mouth, but I think it really, <laughs> yeah, yeah. really gets it. Um, so yeah, in in that particular chapter that he wrote, fairies are actually listed under um, this category that was like superstitious belief and practice. And so several years later, when that handbook was revised, there was um, a folklorist named Charlotte Berm who felt that. Um, the original category of superstitious belief and practice was like way too nebulous. And instead she devised these subcategories for goblindom, <laughs> um, which included wish hounds, local demons, fairies, and brownies. And then she went um, several steps further and delineated them by like physical appearance. So she had on like one end of the spectrum was diminutive and on the other end was heavy, plodding, and stupid. Um, and then because she couldn't help herself, she just like flung herself over the side of the cliff and she divided the Goblindom Kingdom into nine subcategories. So she was going really hard on trying to classify all these different types of goblins and fairies. And so and you see the same thing that's happening in the Journal of American Folklore at the same time. Like there is such a heavy emphasis placed on um, methodological like categorization as a means to validate and legitimize their collection efforts. And so it's actually really funny because it becomes this circus when there are so many heated debates um, regarding the Fae that are happening at conferences between like professionals and amateurs. And I like, I, I just can't imagine that happening today. <laughs> like people were really worked up about how to um, 
create like classification schemas for the Fae. And maybe it's it's still, these conversations are still happening and I'm just like not privy to them, but it was happening on an academic level. And I think that's just sort of like sets it apart. Mm-hmm. So I think that was a really interesting note. So these, these more um, paranormal or I guess what would seem sensational to some uh, aspects of folklore were especially being sought out at the time? Yeah, um, but I think sort of <laughs> the, and this was towards like the end of my notes on this section, but like all of these things that are happening, right? So you have these intense debates that are happening. There's like discussions about the spiritual nature of fairies. Like, were they godlike? Were they connected to ancient or primitive like religious belief systems? Um, like all of that um, type of questioning is also happening in the United States as well, where you have folklorists like Auntie Arne and Stith Thompson who are working tirelessly to index these like tale types and motifs as they relate to folk tales and like naturally fairy lore is included in that. And also like fairy tale scholarship is tossed in there as well. And so there are, again, questions about like authenticity and origins and comparative literature and methodology, like all of those things are fueling these debates. But at this point, like it's all based on lore, like the verbal, like we had mentioned verbal or oral or sort of like these written traditions and not exactly on like personal experience narratives that deal with direct witnesses. Does that make sense? So like, yeah. And so I was just like trying to comb through maybe like the last um, 15 to 20 years, just of like the Journal of Folklore Research and like the Journal of American Folklore, um, sort of some of these like staple publications in the field to find anything, you know, specifically related to like, I encountered a fairy or like I have experience with the fame and I was just coming up really short. And so I would say like from a contemporary perspective, I can't help but think of like Hellier, right? And it's connections between like critters and goblins and elementals. And then I'm also reminded of like um, Passport to Magonia, where like all of these things are the same thing. (laughs) Like there's no, you know, they just present sort of differently. Yeah, and Valet was drawing from, he was making a direct parallel to uh, the fairy lore. Right. To what was, to some of the UFO cases and contact cases that he had collected. Right. And so I just think it's sort of fascinating that like, as humans, we insist on like wanting to devise, um, you know, sort of like classification schemas again, or like taxonomies and indices to like help our brains make sense of what we've seen or what we've heard or felt. And so it's funny because like, I belong to a a witchcraft subreddit. (laughs) And I mean, there are like dozens of posts about folks who are interacting with the Fae and rules and warnings and like success stories of like, this is how, you know, um, I was able to approach them. And like, what are we supposed to take away from those types of threads, right? Like as a folklorist, I can document them and I can use them as fodder for research and analysis. But like as a human being, uh, who is just like very much interested in high strangeness and in the interdimensional, like, how do I make sense of this? You know, yeah. where, and I guess that's just, you know, talking and having conversations with folks like you <laughs> uh, and like Nathan Isaac and, you know, people who are close and engaging too on the internet, just like, what, what do we do with this? Like, wh- how do we even make sense of this? I think something important to stress is that like uh, the study of folklore is not about establishing some kind of like objective truth or reality. It's just about these folk ways and beliefs that people may have. Right. Yeah. Again, like there's no, I, I could never like put my foot down and say that like 
I'm an expert or I'm an authority on any of these things, right? That like my job as a folklorist is to um, listen with like patience and kindness and curiosity when people tell me these stories. Um, and if they are interested that I can share mine as well. Um, and there's like, that's also a, a heated debate in the field of folklore as well. Like when, um, when and where do you draw the line of like being an impartial observer and then being a witness, right? So like, that's just, it's a fine line to walk, especially when someone like myself is so pumped <laughs> about the uh, occult and the esoteric. Like all of these things are, are so fun to me. And it's hard to separate those things sometimes from like professional pursuits and then personal pursuits. Right. Yeah, that's understandable. Um, I mean, you can look at it both ways. I mean, you can be into it and then have that your your other sense going where you are documenting it, you know, and, and because I think that this it really does work on both levels. Yeah. I mean, do you guys have any like any th or I should say, what are your thoughts <laughs> um, about interacting with the Fae or the elementals or have you had any experiences of your own that you could chalk up to um, these types of beings? I, you know, I don't really, I couldn't really tell you that I've had any experience that might be the Fae or like, or fairies. Um, but I think that just when you're talking about like the classification, I think what we're dealing with is all kind of like the same type of entity. I mean, whether we're talking about the fairies or we're talking about the djinn or goblins or whatever, we're just kind of like talking about the other. I think, and you never know. I mean, I, there were some, you know, experiences that I had as a kid, but that, I think that was more like the go, kind of along the ghost realm. But then if we're talking, if all this stuff is kind of like the same, but it just takes different guises, I guess you could say it was that. I think it just depends, um, just what your perspective is. So let's talk about uh urban legends and also want to talk about conspiracy theories because this is conspiracy normal after all sure i do want to make the point real quick yeah. that um with urban legends uh all folklore is not necessarily rural even though oh that's yeah kind of the for sure story. yeah <laughs> oh that gets um cleared up pretty quickly yeah for sure for sure so I mean, seeing urban legends and conspiracy theory, it, it almost seems to me like, especially lately, like they're both kind of becoming the same thing. Like, I don't know, even 10 years ago, I could probably make the distinction, but I feel like <laughs> with like the growth of something like QAnon, like urban legend and conspiracy theory have almost become the same, the same thing. Or maybe it's really what they're engaging in is more urban legend than it is conspiracy theory, but it's actually labeled conspiracy theory. Yeah, or like an urban legend, a local urban legend will right. roll out and and try to uh, people try to associate it with a larger conspiracy. But yeah, I want to talk a little bit about you, both of those aspects being like just another form of folklore. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so as far as like. Um, I'll just sort of say this at the outset. I am not the most well-versed in um, conspiracy theories. <laughs> um, I know that there are a, a lot of sort of emergent folklorists whose um, scholarship is really focused on that. And um, I'll, I'll list those folks in, in just a minute. But if we are looking at um, urban legends from a folkloristic standpoint, um, just sort of like a, a general definition is that these are like stories that are set in the recent past or in our current world, but they can't really be proven definitively, right? Mm -hmm. So um, they're usually about people and their actions or their deeds, or they could be about um, a historical figure or an historical event. And at some point, the facts get a little loosey-goosey. And so you have some small kernel of truth that is mixed in with details that are like clearly exaggerated. Yeah. Um, but these legends often encourage like appropriate moral conduct, or they offer some um, sort of insight about a culture or a region. 
So, you know, as we talked about in an earlier conversation, conversation that there was like an attempt to define folklore, contemporary legend, um, like it's, it faces the same issue. So in the early 1990s, folklorists were just like going absolutely bonkers over what constitutes like contemporary or modern. And so again, there were like attempts at qualifying or categorizing the genre. Um, and these were just like really messy. I mean, folklore is just a messy field. We got to get used to it. And so there was um, a 1995 issue of an academic journal that's just called Folklore. And um, there was one folklorist who attempted to craft like a qualitative and subjective definition that theorized that um, a contemporary legend narrates events which purportedly occurred within a temporal horizon felt as contemporary by participants in the narrative event. So like, lordy God, right? Like, <laughs> like just to sort of even unpack that definition takes a little bit of work. But there are other folklorists who argue that there isn't like a clearly defined corpus of what can be considered contemporary legends. Um, but we often tend to think of these tales like the vanishing hitchhiker or the hook um, as contemporary legends. But, you know, there are other folklorists who say that these are belief legends, which are like just simple stories with texts that contain traditional themes and motifs. So like contemporary legends aren't new, but they are updated versions of older legends, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So like they're variants of legends that have been around for centuries. Like I, there's just so much. <laughs> there's, there have been so many attempts to parse like what the term itself means. And like Academic folklorists are great. I work with them all the time, but there's like at a point where it just starts to feel like navel gazing, right? Like, oh, I'm just going to do this theoretical work. And so I think maybe it helps to think about contemporary legend in terms of like what it reveals about a culture's social fears. Like mm -hmm. um, some popular examples are contaminated consumer goods, right? Like, oh, there's a razor in um, Halloween candy. <laughs> yeah. Or like about muggings or abductions or like covert operations by the upper echelon, right? Like fluoridated water. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, my poor teeth. Um, <laughs> but then like, then it just becomes, I don't know, like easy to assume that the attitude of the storyteller is somehow fixed when they tell these legends as well. Like the storyteller has to believe the fears or the wishes that are being expressed within the contemporary legend. And like, that's not necessarily the case in every storytelling event. Like just because I share um, like the vanishing hitchhiker with you doesn't necessarily mean that I believe, right? Like what is going on in that legend. So I don't know, like instead of getting bogged down by that minutia, I, like maybe we can just let the term sort of breathe on its own <laughs> and just like operate under the idea that contemporary means like now-ish. Does that help? Yes. You know, like again, and, and there are all these different sort of, um, you know, tail types again, as we see, and like, there's something called an oikotype, which is just a really fun word to say. Um, but that just means like when you are, an oikotype is when you are telling a contemporary legend, you make it specific to a place, right? So like, oh, the vanishing hitchhiker, like the folks were, you know, on, I don't know, East Mount Vernon Street you know, like something that's very close to where I live. And so you're adding that personal touch to it. But it's, again, it's just a really fun word to say. You should try type. To, there you go. You should try saying it sometime. Just let it roll off the tongue. Say it, Adam. Oika type. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> are there any particular urban legends that uh, are your favorites? 
I remember getting uh, my my mom bought me like an urban legend um, book when I don't know maybe in like the early to mid two thousands, and I can only remember like the really dirty st- <laughs> the really <laughs> dirty stories. <laughs> That were like in that book. I just think my brain was like, you know, on hormone overload. And I was like, oh my gosh. But it's like always just like, I don't know, the dirtiest ones of like a dog and some peanut butter or like a gerbil uh-huh. and a vacuum hose, like all of those right, things. Right. Really- you talk about the Richard Gear. <laughs> I never really thought of those as urban legends before. Well, yeah, those those are urban legends. For sure. And so, like, I mean. Well, they said it was a particular person that we knew. Well, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you this, though. This is interesting. Um, When I was in seventh grade, uh, there was, and this is a perfect example of how an urban legend can get started. I guess this is an example of an Oika type. So there was this um, weatherman in the local Chattanooga airwaves. And I mean, this is early 90s and he was gay. So, you know, there's there's a lot more homophobia then than there is now. But all of a sudden you started hearing this rumors that this guy had, let's just say, sexual relations with a cat. And... I might have to put the explicit on this one, but, but the, that he showed up at the, uh, hospital with the cat on him. And so uh, this apparently, as I later found out is just, was just a, a, another, like he, apparently somebody started this rumor and you heard it from, I remember hearing it from the kids in school and they say, well, my mom knows, uh, my mom's hairdresser knows this person's brother. And that, you know, and it's just like, and it, so it gave it this form of auth- authenticity and it, and it went on for so long that eventually like the Chattanooga, uh, paper had to like write about it and that say like, this is story. not true. This did not happen. <laughs> You know, and I and I think it really started because this guy was gay, and somebody you know wanted to kind of destroy his reputation. But this this was it was just really weird, really bizarre. Yeah, and you know that again, it's like it might not be a reflection of every single person's um, you know beliefs towards homosexuality, but like it, it is definitely sort of like in tune with the times right um so like there's that societal fear that's like rearing its head through that Mm -hmm. um really briefly another term that we love to use as folklorists is um fof which is f-o-a-f and it stands for friend of a friend (laughs) Um, it was that was kind of similar yeah yeah and so it you know that's always a part of um sharing that information right like you don't necessarily have a direct tie to it but you might know someone who does again um offering validation or authenticity as you said yeah and you and i think you see that in conspiracy theory too where like well especially now because it's like well i did my research and this guy on the internet said this such and such thing and you i think you see that all over the place now oh yeah absolutely um, I just remember when I was, um, a, like a reference librarian, right? Like have some of the information that people, older folks like got online, it really easy for them to be scammed. <laughs> um, and you know, I think it's sort of similar to conspiracy theories as well. Like there's such an, a low level of analysis and there's like a really easy buy-in, right? Like if you're not, um, if you're sort of lacking in digital literacy, then like everything just seems very true and very pressing when you're online. This is like, like the, the Nigerian, Nigerian print scandal. Uh, scams oh, yeah. and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. It's another um, aspect of sort of like digital folklore. Mm-hmm. Um, this like, you know, chain emails that you would get too. So the function of a lot of conspiracy theory seems to be like explaining dispossession of certain groups of people Mm -hmm. oh yeah like i can 
I can definitely see. Um, and like you said, the fear is like a lot of this stuff from the satanic panic through Pizzagate, QAnon, are some of the same folkloric fears around some of the fairy lore, which is like fears of uh, of children being harmed or taken. Right. Yes. So it's almost like the same old stories. Um, yeah. And I mean, just like touching very briefly on um, ideas of like truth or fake news or conspiracy theories in 2022, um, I would maybe encourage folks to um, check out, there's a special issue of the Journal of American Folklore that was published in 2018 um, that was titled Fake News, Definitions, and Approaches. And so this, again, was a special issue that was like an attempt to sort of get ahead of the curve. The publishing process is like a notoriously long one. And so um, this particular issue is based on panel discussions and papers that had been presented at um, the annual conference the year before. And so the articles um, in that issue are like fairly informal and like they're very um, approachable. And so it's just a bunch of folklorists like, how are, again, are we going to like tackle fake news? You know, like it's this idea that once fake news leaves its creator and it travels through like the digital or visual or written and verbal realms, it transforms into genres that folklores have like studied from the beginning. So all of these things can be found in like legends, jokes, songs, and at this point, memes, which, um, you know, I love that there's a, a special department at the Library of Congress that is um, archiving memes. <laughs> I just think that's really beautiful. <laughs> I don't know if I do. <laughs> and, you know, that's also, uh, yeah, that's definitely a, a part of folklore. And so, I don't know, I just uh, recommend seeking out that special issue again if you're sort of interested in that type of work. So That's getting at something I think is interesting as far as, like, how folklore, modern, th this, you know, uh, super modern, hyper modern internet based folklore spreads now because there's no there's no uh, territory to it. And it seems like this is really something new when I've seen just in like communities that I've grown up and been involved in really like a, a loss of a lot of different uh, localized traditions uh, for kind of this like new uh, monoculture and a lot of like music forms and things like that. Um, I've seen a lot of regionalisms kind of disappear with the new generations because they're all, um, you know, like essentially getting their inspirations and, and sources from like the same place now. Right. And so it's like, how do we differentiate between um, mass culture, popular culture, in like folk culture, right? So like these things are being shared informally online. Um, you know, sometimes we can track down its origins, but sometimes it just sort of pops up out of nowhere. And, you know, again, we can look back to those five characteristics that we discussed at the beginning of the interview and like, can these characteristics still be applied to folklore as it's created in the digital realm? So. And I think there are a lot of, um, again, like emergent folklorists, early sort of like early career professionals who are, I don't know, in their 20s and 30s, maybe a little bit more um, hip to technology, <laughs> who are really sort of like making that um, their goal right now, you know? Um, I don't know, it's just really exciting to see the different type of folkloric work that's being done online. Yeah, that's cool. We kind of feel like the podcasting world that we're involved in is um, kind of the new uh, version of like what the zine scene was in the 80s and 90s to some of these paranormal and UFO and conspiracy communities. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I can I can definitely see that in creating again, like, yeah, just creating these online communities of folks who 
listen to your podcasts or like engage with you. Um, I don't know, through discord or on Facebook, like these people who attend your conferences because of what they've heard, you know, like, I don't know, that must be really exciting for you guys to get to continue to share um, the, the work that you do. Oh yeah, it definitely is. It definitely is. It's, it's, it's very well worth it. And I mean, we've, we've, uh, we've also talked about too, um, a lot, um, that we feel like we're kind of documenters too, because there's a lot of oral history that's involved with doing this. And especially with a lot of the people that are older, um, that are in these communities that, you know, I mean, there's a couple, there's a few people that since I've been doing this for 10 years that have passed away. And so it's like their voices and, and other shows too, but not just mine, but, but their voices are preserved because of what the stuff mm-hmm. that us and others are doing. So, and with those changing media landscapes, um, you know, a lot of younger people who are getting into the subjects now may not, you know, they're not going to have the same, paths to find some of these right. people we're talking about books or or you know previous media so we want to like kind of try to connect those those roots i i'm curious as we kind of close down uh wind down delaney um what intrigues you about where you're at now in the somerset kentucky area is there any kind of folklore that's regional there that you are particularly interested in I mean, I feel like my answer to that is just listen to the Penny Royal podcast. Um, (laughs) You know, Nathan really does a great job of going down that rabbit hole of high strangeness that's, you know, right here in downtown Somerset. Um, But I was also trying to think, too, of just there's a a really great website called um, The Sound of Shaking Paper. And I know that Nathan used that as a resource for um, season one of Penny Royal, which is um, a woman, her name is uh, Dora Whitaker, who is archiving and transcribing and like digitizing all of this work um, from like newspapers and journals and different reports about not necessarily high strangeness, but of... um, like crime (laughs) that was happening um, during um, she from like the 1870s, maybe up to the 1930s here in South Central Kentucky. And so I just have that um, website in a tab that's open like 24, 24 seven, because she does such a wonderful job of like tracking down um, murders and, you know, bribe scandals and like all of this stuff that's just so fascinating to see that it happened right here in downtown Somerset. And then getting to link those up with um, some of my own research with like Sanborn maps and, you know, sort of like deeds and property lines, like all of that stuff. I don't know, just again, maybe not necessarily what you're looking for in regards to like the paranormal or high strangeness. But if we are to think of like, really intense emotions leaving an imprint on a place then like a murder right down the road is definitely going to do that you know and so how are we like engaging with that how are we reacting to it no no again just like so many cool projects that people are doing on their own time and they just like make them available to us what what is that (laughs) i'm really (laughs) thankful Yeah, I'm really thankful for for that type of work and those people who are so generous in, in making that type of content accessible. Well, you've also got that interesting little monolith um, in the middle of downtown Somerset that's very fascinating that we, that we got to see. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I went there um, a few nights ago um, with someone that was after a date. And I was really excited to show (laughs) this monument to this person and they didn't even care about it. And I was like, I don't think I can ever call you back again. (laughs) You know, you find me you're not excited about like Masonic symbols. (laughs) 
Yeah, that uh, that thing is is fascinating. It, um, yeah, it, it truly is. And like I wrote about it in my editor's letter for yeah. the first issue of our um, digital magazine. It's just like, man, if there's ever a beacon in Somerset, like that's going to be it. Yeah, and it's unfortunately going to be knocked down. Yeah, and like everything around it right now is just rubble. You yeah. know, it's just been raised and cleared, and somehow that that monument is still standing. So, it reminded me a lot of the Georgia Guidestones. Mm, mm-hmm. And that's what I told Nathan when I when I, when we first saw it. Yeah, and I mean, there was you know looking back at sort of um, local lore that there was like a hanging tree. That was, you know, sort of supposedly located um, next to that monument. And like the town spring and like whoever drinks from this spring will return to Somerset. It's like, ooh, (laughs) just so much that's tied in with that. Very fascinating place. I I took several pictures of it when we were there. Um, Yeah. Um, So you are going to be joining us in October for the Strange Realities Conference. I am. And uh, very happy to have you. Thank Uh, you. Do you know what you might be speaking about? I finally decided. (laughs) I feel so goofy talking about this. This is exclusive here, people. (laughs) Yeah, you heard it here first. Hot goss coming in. Um, So I have always been interested in um, chaos magic, but have never taken the time to, like, establish... um, a routine in in regards to practice and i've been doing some research about the creation of sigils which i you know do every so often um but the idea of thought forms has been um on my mind a lot lately and so i think what i would like to do is to conduct you know an experiment where i create my own servitor <laughs> and um, get to share that experience with folks who attend. So we'll see, see how that goes. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Very cool. Do I want this servitor to help me find buried treasure? I mean, that's part of it too, right? Yes, it is. Will I encounter a Bigfoot? I know that Timothy Runner says that Bigfoot and, uh, you know, buried treasure are often closely linked. So we'll see how it turns out. Well, we are looking forward to that. And uh, where can people find you, Delaney, and uh, uh, see the things that you've that that you've written and and all that? Oh, please don't ever contact me. <laughs> 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 um, no, the easiest place um, would be kyfolklifemag.org. So that is our um, digital magazine, Kentucky Folklife. And yeah, that's about the the one spot. You can find um, my collection of interviews with the pro wrestlers on the Library of Congress's website. If you care to, uh, you know, take a listen to those, they are up for your listening needs. (laughs) Well, uh, stay on the line. We're going to close out the show. Um, Yeah, um, sure. Again, thank you guys so much. Thank you for joining us. Jelady is going to be with us at Strange Realities Conference October 14th through the 16th in Nashville, Tennessee. We'd like you guys to come out and join us, but online tickets are available as well. So you guys will be able to to view it from home if you'd like, but uh, you really should come. It's 2022. There's no excuse now. So, uh, but Patreon is up as well. The next um, online event through our Patreon is going to be with Walter Bosley. That is going to be May 20th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And Serfiel can tell you where you can find the Patreon. You can find the Patreon at patreon.com slash conspiranormal. Uh, where if you join the mystic crew of Conspira Normal, you will get to attend all of the Strange Realities streaming events every month for free. Uh, at the $5 level of the uh, International Association of Conspira Normalists, you will get 
semi-weekly or we're trying to do as many as we can uh yep. patreon extra episodes to check out as well as other cool stuff but there's a lot on there already there so. is a whole lot so if you join now you can uh you have hours and hours of endless entertainment pretty much yep. and uh if you're feeling very generous you can join the ancient circle of strange realities for the 20 dollar and up uh level you get to attend the strange reality streaming events as well and of course all of the uh bonus podcasts and you get some free swag from conspiracy normal and the strange realities conference all right guys uh next week uh we will have walter bosley on and doing a paranoid style so that's going to come out as well that may be out before this i'm not sure but join us next time on conspiranormal please consider becoming a Patreon at www.patreon.com slash conspiranormal or leave a one-time donation at conspiranormal.com. And please check out our YouTube channel, Conspiranormal Podcast.